growing up, I did not like the word authority because of my experience with authority figures. My dad left the family when I was three years old and we did not hear from him until I was 14. The man who was supposed to provide for and protect his family was gone. I love my dad, but he has no moral authority over my life. When I moved to the United States, I had several unpleasant experiences with authority figures. And one of them happened in middle school when my teachers told me that I would amount to nothing and that my, my only pathway in life would be through the prison system. At that moment, all I wanted to do was to punch her, but that would make her wish come true. It was hard for me to trust the authority figures around me because in my eyes, they were failing me every time. Uh, some of you might not like the word authority because it brings bad memories, while others of you don't mind the word at all. We might view the authority concept differently due to our experiences. You might perceive the demand of authority figures as unreasonable and dumb and wonder what life would be like if there was no authority. Others might view authority figures as worthy of respect and believe the, the life would be chaotic without them. Even though we might view authority differently, all of us has some form of authority in our lives. We can define authority by looking at the areas and places where we spend most of our lives. For example, the family unit has an authority figure at your home. Who is that authority figure? There is an authority figure at your job or school. When we look at our government, there is an authority figure. You might not like the authority figure, but nevertheless, there is one. The Bible tells us that there are different levels of authority and they are expressed according with responsibility. We are in our third week of the series, Compassion and Conviction. The goal for today's message is to give reasons to believe that the Bible is trustworthy and should be our sole authority. There are two types of authority, derivative and ultimate. Derivative authority is not inherent. Inherent, another word, uh, someone give it to you. Uh, there are so many examples of derivative authority in the Bible. So let's look at just two of them. The first one is in 1 Samuel chapter 8. When the prophet Samuel was old, he had appointed his sons to rule over the Israelites, but his sons were not leading with integrity. The elders of Israel were fed up with the way they were being led. So they approached Samuel and said to Samuel, look, you are now old and your sons are not like you. Give us a king to judge us like all the other nations have. The second one is in John chapter 19. After Jesus was convicted of a crime he did not commit, he appeared before Pilate, who was trying to exercise his power over Jesus. Then Jesus said to Pilate, you would not, you would have no power over me at, at all unless it were given to you from above. This is what human authority looks like. So human authority is derivative. It is giving either by other people or giving by God. Derivative authority is good, but can fall short because we live in a falling world. When we come, when it comes to ultimate authority, uh, we must ask ourselves these questions. Who really owns authority? Who has the last word? Who is the final uh, judge of right and wrong? Who will uh, ultimately bring justice? You probably would say, God. And you are right. God is the ultimate authority. Therefore, the definition of ultimate authority is God's lordship 
expressed toward his creation. The prophet Isaiah says, for the Lord is God and he created the heavens and earth and put everything in place. He made the world to be lived in, not to be a place of empty chaos. I am the Lord, he says, and there is no other. God has revealed himself to us as Lord. Since he is the one who created us, he has the right to tell us what to do, what is right and wrong, and command us to live a certain way that honors him. No human beings or created thing shares in this ultimate authority. It belongs to God alone and is revealed to us through the Bible. And God is filled with compassion for us. So he spoke his truth to us, knowing we would not fully understand the world around us apart from his word. It is only by hearing and obeying God's voice in the Bible, we can understand the brokenness in our world. Uh, there is no other worldview that can answer life's most uh, difficult questions. It is only God through his word, the Bible, who sheds light on, on our present circumstances in this falling world. The author of Genesis and says this about God's authority over his creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The author is pointing to God as the central character of the grand story of the Bible. It is all about God and his desire to be in relationship with us. The author of Genesis gives us a full view of God's story. God had a grand vision to be with us and enjoying a pleasant life with us. This is foundational, that God made everything that we see, hear, taste, touch, and feel. Brent reminded us uh, two weeks ago that God created something out of nothing. In the beginning, there was nothing but God. Then God spoke everything into existence. We see God's authoritative uh, voice in, in his creation. He spoke and, and things uh, came into existence. That is real power and authority. My son and I used to love going to the Mall of America uh, to play with Legos. There used to be uh, an area in front of the Lego store with a couple of big bins full of types of Lego parts. It was rough uh, trying to get parts from the bins when there were so many kids around. Uh, some of those kids did not understand that these Legos parts were to share with each other. Uh, sometimes I literally had to move kids out of the way uh, to find or to get Lego parts. It had the feeling of every person for themselves. <laughs> My son and I would spend hours creating different things. And there was a time I had to help him out a lot with building his Lego sets. But as he got older, he could create his own set. He would be so proud of his creation and, and, and make sure that I acknowledge his creativity by saying, Daddy, look. Or he'll say, Daddy, look at what I had made. He would then proceed to tell me how he made them and, and, and what part he used to make his creation function a certain way. And then we would display them. What does this narrative of Genesis 1-1 have to do with us and the authority of the Bible. Everything, everything. Genesis 1-1 sets the pattern for the rest of the Bible. It provides the framework we need to rightly understand God's authority. When God speaks, things happen. His word is the creative power over all that exists. Paul tells us in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is inspired by God. 
What does it mean that God inspired? Uh, the human authors of the Bible wrote the words on paper in their own style. But the ultimate source of the information is God, not human. That means every word in the Bible possesses the authority of God and the right to rule over us. The authority of scripture does not depend on our co cooperation or understanding, but on the power and the supremacy of God as the author. He has the final say in everything, even if we don't agree and choose to not submit. I used to drive a Dutch Stratus. In the middle of my first winter in Minnesota, the battery, the battery was dead. But I had a problem. I could not find a battery. I, I thought I, I had looked everywhere. I finally uh, got the car towed to the mechanic for a new battery. It cost me almost $400. And on top of that, my wife had to put everything that she had to do uh, uh, that day aside because I needed to take the second car to work. A few weeks later, I was looking for something in the glove compartment and I noticed the car manual. Guess what I saw when I opened the manual? Yep, you got it the battery located in, uh, in the left front fender, right above the wheel. It is the weirdest place to put a battery. If only I had read uh, the manual before I towed the car, I would have saved myself a little pain and some money. Uh, the maker of the Stratus knows everything about that car, including the location of the battery and how the car works best. So they have the authority to tell me, and that did in the manual I was provided. There are so many objective reasons uh, to validate that the Bible alone is the revealed word of God and can be trusted. Uh, due to time, we will just cover just two, just three of them, I should say, but you can read more about them in the updated version of this book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict by Josh and Sean uh, McDowell. The first objective reason is the Bible itself made the claim. Peter said in 2 Peter 1, above all, you must realize that no prophecy in scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding or from human initiative. No, these, those prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit and they spoke from God. Just in the Old Testament alone, there are over 2,000 phrases such as God said, God spoke, or the Lord came. The Bible claims and views itself as the word of God. Therefore, the Bible has authority because it records the word of God given by God. My Dodge Stratus that I talked about earlier could not handle the cold weather in Minnesota. So it died on me. A friend gave me a Buick LeSabre. My kids call it Big Mama because... It was a big car, it was a big car. A couple years ago, I was on my way uh, from work. Uh, when I walked out into the parking lot, I noticed my administrative assistant needed help with her car. She had the hood uh, of her car up, so I approached to see if I could help. Her battery was dead. I thought I could help start her car and become the hero that saved the day. I pulled Big Mama next to her car and, and opened the hood of my car. I could not find a battery to connect the jumper cables. I thought I knew where the battery was supposed to be, but it was not there. I searched all over under the hood of the car, including in the left, inside the left fender. I was getting a little embarrassed and frustrated 
since I approached the situation as the person who knew what he was doing. But now I was questioning my knowledge. Where could the battery be? The most embarrassing part was when my students started passing by and, and asking me if I was all right. I did not want to tell them that I was looking for the battery in my car. They would have thought that I was a dodo or a knuckerhead. I then remembered my Dodge Stratus. So I quickly uh, looked at, at the manual for the location of the battery. The battery was located under the back seat. Another weird place to place the battery. I found it and jumped her car and, and she was very thankful. See, God gave us his word to help us, also to help others. So it is important that we are constantly reading his word. The second objective reason is authorship. The Bible was written in three different languages over a period of 1,500 years on three different continents by more than 40 people from different backgrounds. The authors include kings, doctors, fishermen, military leaders, tax collectors, and even some who are unknown. The biblical writers include almost every kind of people, rich, poor, young, old, wise, foolish, and innocent and guilty. There is a unity within these different authors because from the beginning to the end, the main author is God himself and he's playing for salvation for all people through his son, Jesus Christ. And the third objective reason is prophecy. Prophecy is one of the most impactful reasons that validate the Bible alone is the revealed word of God. A prophecy is predictions that have come to pass. The Bible said things would happen and there happened. It is the most powerful evidence of divine authorship and divine authority of scripture. God is the only one who knows and determines the future. The Bible is the only religious book in the world that has two different distinct, I should say, volumes, the Old and the New Testaments. One predicts that what will happen and the other records that it happened. One example of this uh, prophecy in is Isaiah is in Isaiah 53. The prophet, uh, the prophecy uh, came to pass uh, 700 years after it was written. Uh, there is a lot to unpack from Isaiah 53. And again, there is not enough time. But I'll say this. When we read the passage, we see the full gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and the epistles in that passage. Now, the passage answers the question that everyone needs to know, which is, how can a sinner come into a relationship with the Holy God? The passage forecasts salvation, forgiveness, reconciliation, and eternal life provided by the sacrificial death of the chosen and acceptable lamb who bore the sin of all people by willingly taking upon himself the full wrath of God. The details of the Messiah's suffering and death are so complex, but only God, the creator of all things, the one who sees all things, could disclose them 700 years before they happen. That leads to this question. How does the authority of the Bible impact our lives. The Bible has, impact, has impacted our lives in more ways than we will ever know. It shaped the Western civilization more than any other book. It has influenced and continues to influence history, literature, government, and so on. As Christian, when we read the Bible, we feel convicted if there is an area in our lives that is not in line with the word of God. 
Hebrews 4, 12 says, for the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our inmost thoughts and desires. After I became a Christian, the pastor gave me a Bible and encouraged me to read it. Not too long, uh, not too long after, we went to a conference where the speaker shared Psalm 119. Here are the two verses that moved me. Uh, David says in verses 99 and 100, yes, I have more insight than my teachers, for I am always thinking of your laws. I am even wiser than my elders, for I have kept your commandments. During that time, I had a terrible attitude toward authorities due to my experience with them. I was a new a Christian and did not understand the Bible. So I took these verses for what they said. My goal was to outsmart my teachers and authorities. So I spent the next two years reading the Bible and meditated on it. That was a transformation that took place in my heart. All of a sudden, my attitude toward authority changed and my grades started to change. I became a better son to my parents, a better student to my teachers, a better player to my coaches, and a better person to society. Something extraordinary happened when I, start, when I started to read the Word of God. No other book has changed me the way the Bible has. If the Bible has been given to us by the inspiration of God, if it is clear, necessary, and sufficient, if it changes lives, if, it's a, if it stands as the infallible foundation for how we interpret the world around us, then this Bible stands in place of unique authority in our lives. That leads to the second question. Why do so many reject the authority of the Bible? People reject the authority of the Bible for various reasons. Uh, some might reject the Bible because they cannot bypass their own intellectual concern. And some might reject it because they prefer uh, their own wisdom and want to be their own boss. Now, some might reject it because they, they don't believe that there is a God. So the Bible has no authority over them. Now, some might reject it because uh, the Bible gets in the way of their sinful desires. The truth is that Satan does not like the word of God. So he is trying uh, to make sure that people did not come near it. He will do anything in his power to make people question God's word by using the same approach he used with Eve in Genesis 3.1. Did God really say? Satan wants us to question God's goodness and to believe the lie that God is holding something good from us and God is a, is a taker, not a giver. God and his uh, compassion and loving kindness gave us his truth, the only truth, so we can live life the way he intended. Uh, Pastor Spencer said last week, when we live our lives by, by God's truth, we are expressing our love for God. So our sermon in a sentence is, the Bible is trustworthy and our sole authority. My daughter called me a couple weeks ago from Hawaii uh, to help her replace her, her car's headlight. She looked at some uh, videos and she wanted to make sure that she was doing it the right way. 
through FaceTime, I walk her through the process as she was replacing the bulb. Uh, she was, it was amazing that she felt comfortable and confident as she was working on her car because she knew her helper or her guide was right there. And all she had to do was to follow the direction that I was giving her. When it comes to conviction and compassion on the authority of the Bible, we must remember that conviction and compassion is a two-sided coin. It is not an or, but an and. It needs both sides to make it complete. Before we condemn those who might not believe in the Bible, we must remember some of us who believe in the Bible might not be reading it constantly. And some of us who are reading it might not obey everything it says we have the tendency to be selective in our obedience. And the apostle James reminds us in James 2.10 that if we stumble in one commandment, we break all. Because God's law is a perfect harmonious revelation of his divine will. When we choose to, to select the part that we like or agreed with we ign and ignore the rest, we reveal our wish is to do our own will, not God's. God, in his loving mercy, chooses to deal with us with both conviction and compassion on a daily basis. Here's an example in Romans 3. Conviction says, for everyone has sinned, we all fall short of God's glorious standard. And then compassion says this, yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. Jesus is the word of God. The apostle John tells us when the time was right, the word became flesh and lived among us. While the Bible reveals God, Jesus is the full expression of the invisible God. Jesus, the living word, became our prophet, our priest, and our king. He has all the authority and he is the perfect model of what authority looks like. He uses his authority not to oppress, but to free us from our bondage. He uses his authority not for his own advantage, but to bring us into a relationship with God the Father. He uses his authority not as a means of self-indulgence, but to die in order to bring life to all who believe in him. As a response to his authority over us, we are to submit to his word. Are you allowing your life to be shaped by his word? Are you growing in your understanding and application of his word? Are you allowing scriptures uh, to be the final authority in your life? So my application points for this message are, one, create some margin in your schedule to read the Bible. Two, choose a daily Bible reading plan, and three, find ways to make it fun and meaningful. Remember, the Bible is trustworthy in our soul authority. It is the only book that changes lives and moves people to live differently. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your great love. We thank you for your loving mercy. Because you love us so much, you gave us your word. You gave us your word. God, we pray, 
Help us, Lord, to receive the word and become doers of the word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.